first and foremost want to just thank uh, my pastors, Pastor Benny and Sister Evelyn, because not only are they my parents, but they're my leaders. And man, you're talking about the real deal, hardcore for Jesus people. And I am just privileged to be raised not only in my home, but even as growing up and even being able to be under them in our church. It's just such a privilege that you, you have no idea what we have and um, pray for Pastor Benny. He got his knee surgery done today and um, <laughs> he's out with his foot elevated and let's, I'm just grateful that it was a success, amen. I was like, oh my God, Jesus, we're not ready for you to take him home. <laughs> and so it was good and he's, he's healing and I'm just so thankful and I'm also thankful for my mother-in-law who came to come th this evening to hear me share and I'm just so blessed to know what good, how good God is. His goodness is just, I feel like it's chasing after me because he's just so good. And, um, but today, I, I, we're going to be talking about expansion, amen, the process to expand. And I know that um, you heard her, her, Sister Hershana say that I've been serving the Lord for 20 years, and, and I love serving Jesus. I mean, I, I served God when I was younger, and I backslid, and I never thought that I would come back to God like the way that I did. And on August 7th of 2001, I'm telling you, my mom said only two people she saw radically changed, and it was um, my dad and me. Like, I was literally going one way, and then I, like, literally turned. I mean, my language... Everything about me changed. I mean, I was an entirely different person. I've been touched by God, and, and, and I'm just so blessed to be able to serve him and see what he's done. If you've known me, you knew that I never wanted to get married. And I thought it was the bride of Christ, which we all are, amen. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm grateful for my husband because he's just so wonderful and I'm just over blessed, amen. But needless to say, along with that, there's a process, amen. God continues to expand us and we as women in the leadership, we're getting ready for the women's leadership retreat. I don't know how many of you guys are going, but I'm so excited about that. But tonight, I want to share on the process to expand and I'm going to share about Elisha and Elijah. And, and sometimes when we talk about these men, we always talk about the Elijah the older or Elijah the younger. And so I'm going to, the older is of Tishbe and then the younger is the son of Shaphat. Amen. Just say Shaphat. Say Shaphat. So we're going to be talking about Elijah, the son of Shaphat. Amen. Because <laughs> now you're going to know who he is. If we could turn our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19, and I'm going to, um, right here, this is where Elijah of Tisbe is getting a plan from God. This is after he put fire down from heaven, and Jezebel came after him, and I mean, this, the, there's a changing of the guard that's going to take place, and the Lord tells Elisha of Tisbe to anoint Elisha, the son of who? Shaphat. Okay, because you guys are going to remember that today. So I'm going to read it in verse 16, uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 16. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation if it's different. It says, um, this is what Elijah told him. On the, um, it says, then anoint Jehu, the grandson of Nimishi, and the king of Israel. And then anoint Elijah, the son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel, Malaha, to replace you as my prophet. Let's bow our head and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we come before you, my King, and I just thank you for everything that you are doing in my life, Lord, everything that you're doing in the women and here that are in the sound of my voice, and I ask God that you would just move me aside, Lord. I don't know where it is and where we're at with our relationship with you, but I pray, God, that we will all be vessels of honor in your hands, God, that we will be like a clay in the potter's hand, able to be molded and shaped as you see fit, God, to make you happy, Lord, and I ask, God, that you would just give us a hunger and a desire to know more of you. In Jesus' name I pray. We all say amen. Okay, so right here we see, this is the process of Elisha, and I'm going to continue to read uh, in the same chapter. It says in verse 19, it says, Elijah went and found Elijah, the son of Shaphat, plowing in the field. And there were 12 teams of oxen in the field. And Elijah was plowing with the 12th team, and Elijah went over him and threw his cloak on his shoulders and then walked away. 
And so then he basically is telling him, like, you know, you're going to follow me. And in verse 21, it says, Elijah returned to his oxen, slaughtered them, and he used the wood to plow and build a fire and roasted their flesh. And he passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they ate, and he went with Elijah as his assistant. And there's four things that I'm going to share on tonight and regarding the process to expand. It's like, how did you get there? What happened? What did you do? Yes, you said yes to God, but then what happened? You know, it's like we didn't just arrive here like, you know, my dad says, I come to save the day. Like, no, it, it, there was a process. And the first thing is a connection with God. That's the first thing that happened in this process. For Elijah, the son of Shaphat, he had that connection with the prophet Elijah from Tisbe. When he came in, he put the cloak on him. And he basically had said, like, follow me. And, and with him, when he killed all his oxen and all of that, he was basically symbolizing, like, I'm not going back to that lifestyle anymore. I'm not going to do what I used to do. I'm not going to be that same person no more. I'm not going to be a civilian no more. I'm not going to do those things. And, and in, our, in our walk with expanding, if we're going to expand, the first place that it happens is that connection with God. That connection with God, where that calling comes, where we're, where we're able to surrender our life to God. And, and I know that most of us that are here this evening, this process has started. All of you, I'm sure, are saved. I, I don't see, I don't know if somebody brought an unsaved person in here. If, if you're unsaved, you have a chance to get saved. The person that brought you will lead you to the Lord. But right here, this is, this is that connection of the calling of God. Where you turn your life, where you, where you no longer belong to yourself and you belong to God. I mean, he didn't have to leave his home. He didn't have to be his assistant. And many times when we give our life to God, we're like, well, why do I have to, to do that? And how come I have to change this? And what, why do I have to? And, and there's all these different questions. And I want to turn our Bibles real quick to uh, 1 Corinthians. And, and I know that this portion uh, where Paul the Apostle talks about is really extreme because a lot of people are doing sexual perversions. And he's just like, look. Your body isn't yours. It belongs to the Lord. And I'm going to read it right here. And um, I'm just going to read it in verse 19. It says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a huge price. So you must honor your God with your body. And right here, I feel like with Elijah from Shaphat. He honored God with his body because he left everything that he had. He left his comfort zone. He left his home. He left his family. He left his job. Amen. He left everything. And many of you are going to have an opportunity where the cloak of God is going to come upon you. And God is going to call you and say, will you follow me? Will you do this? Will you do that? Will you get out of your comfort zone? Will you, will you do something that, you know, you're afraid to do? Something that you've never done? Go to a place where you've never been. When you saw the video, I mean, it, it was exciting to see people step out of their comfort zone. But God is calling you. Say, God is calling me. God is calling me. Right now, Jesus is calling, knocking on the door for Elisha, the son of Shaphat. He had his opportunity. God said to Elijah from Tisbe, go anoint him and make him your assistant, for he's going to be your prophet. God is calling out to each and every one of you women in ministry here today. He's calling you. It's like he's putting a cloak on you, saying, Woman of God, get ready for ministry. Woman of God, get ready to do a work for me. Woman of God, surrender your life to me. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to me. That's what he's asking. If you want to start the process to expand, it's a constant thing to answer the calling of God. God is calling and he's looking. I mean, he is looking and he's booking. And, and we have to be able to step out. Jesus says this in Luke chapter 9, verse 16. He says, anyone who puts his hands to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. And we know what happened to Lot's wife in Genesis, amen. She looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt. We need women of God in this day and hour. Jesus is coming. We can't be compromising and looking back, seeing if there's a plan B and seeing if there's something else. You know, I don't know if I'm going to answer the call of God. This price is too big. And, and in 1 Corinthians where we just read, he said, he said, weren't you bought with the price? 
You bought with the price, the blood of the lamb. Today I was teaching my son, uh, Enoch, you saw him running around. I was teaching him John 3, 16, because when I was praying, he wanted to, he woke up and he jumped on me. I was like, oh. But I use it as an opportunity because I don't know why he just, he feels like when I'm, when I'm praying and I'm crying, you know, before the Lord. And like, I'm not the one that prays like super loud, like, ah, da, 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 you know, like at the men's home, women's home, or like sometimes in the church. But I just pray silently and, and I have tears and he's like, mommy why are you crying and I'm like well because Jesus died for us and I have this cross with nails and he goes oh yeah Jesus they heard him they heard him he died and I was like yeah so I was like you know what I'm going to teach him John 3 16 today and so I did and he he had a blast he didn't know what perish meant <laughs> you know for God so loved the world that whoever uh, believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life but when I said God's only son I was like Jesus he's like yeah Jesus but anyways, my point is, is that Jesus paid a price for us, and, and we can never forget that. You know, it's such a privilege to serve God. The moment that the calling of God becomes something that's not uh, of value, that's because you forgot what Jesus has done for you, amen? You forgot what happened, what he did. I mean, being beaten beyond recognition, I couldn't even imagine. I mean, I, even my cartoons that I have my kids watch, sometimes I'm like, fast forward, fast forward. <laughs> because, you know, they get sad to see Jesus get hurt. But we ourselves have to be reminded what Jesus has done for us. And we can't look back. What is there for us if we look back? Everybody, I mean, this world is fading away along with everything in it. And here we as believers have the sustenance, has everything that what people need in this day and hour. We have the goods. We have Jesus, and he's looking at us, wanting to use our life, calling us just like how Elijah of Tisbe put the cloak on him. He's putting it on you here tonight, saying, my daughter, do my work. Do what I've called you to do. Do what I'm asking you to do. When he wakes you up in the morning and says, spend time with me. When, when your Bible app starts tinging, read my scripture, read my word. I don't know where you're at, but God knows you, and he knows you by name. And he is calling you, and he is calling you, and he is calling me, and he is calling everyone. Anyone who wants, he who has the ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying, amen. And that is the hour that we're in. And if we want to expand, there's a process. And the first process is the calling of God. And the second thing that I'm going to share on this evening is the connection First it was the connection with the calling of God, and now it's the connection with the leader. Amen. Well, for Elijah of Shaphat, he had that connection with Elisha of Tisbe. The Elijah of Tisbe, I mean, man, you, you mean he faced an evil hour like never before. And the, if you read the Bible and you know the Bible, the time of King Ahab, when Jezebel, his wife, who was just like the evilest, you know, we all hear the spirit of Jezebel. But this woman was like evil and she like everybody that did evil was like got props amen and it was just like evil everywhere and here Elijah the prophet was living in this hour and I feel like that's kind of what's happening now I mean if the more evil you are the more perverted you are the cooler you are you know what I mean I'm like that's lame you know <laughs> <laughs> like some of these famous people that all these people know that are like cool and I'm just like they ain't cool <laughs> I'm like, who are they to Jesus? Like, give me an opportunity to tell them about the Lord, you know? <laughs> because it, it's like sin abounds so greatly. And right here, Elijah, the son of Shaphat, had a bond with his leader, Elijah from Tisbe. Elijah, he stayed with Elijah. He was connected to him. And I want to um, go to 2 Kings. This is when the changing of the guard was going to happen. And... Um, because he already anointed him. He already answered the call. And right here in 2 uh, Kings chapter 2. Um, I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to share it if you want to know where it's at. 2 Kings chapter 2. But he, God was ready to take home the man of God. And he goes to these three places. He goes to Bethel. He goes to Jericho. And then he goes to the Jordan River. And each time he goes to this place, Elijah of Tisbe tells Elijah, the son of Saphat, you can stay here. You don't need to go with me. You don't, need to, you don't need to pay the price no more. You're good. You're good. You did good. You answered the call. Just, just stay. You don't have to keep going. You don't have to put in work no more. 
You know, and, and Elijah, the son of Shaphat, he said, as surely as the Lord lives and you live, I'm going to go wherever you go forever, you know. <laughs> and he had such a connection with his leader. There was a bond. And many of us, we have to have that connection with our leader. If we're going to be in this process to expand, we have to be connected to our leader. Amen? We, I mean, we got the real deal, amen, here at Victory Outreach Las Vegas. We got the real deal. I mean, come hell or high water, we're still standing, amen? And do all to stand and stand there for. <laughs> and this November is going to be 30 years that our pastors have been here. And not only that, if you think about it, even in 1967 when Pastor Sonny and Sister Julie started this ministry, God has called us. Even before that, when David Wilkerson left Pennsylvania to go to New York and Pastor Sonny got saved, God has called us. We have great lineage of leadership we have to be connected. There has to be a connection. There has to be that bond. The way that Elijah Shaphat had with Elijah the son of the, from Tisbe. He, he kept telling him, no, you could just stay here. He goes, I'm going to just read it, how it says. He said, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. That's how committed he was. God is looking for women that are committed. As surely as the Lord lives and breathes. I will not leave <laughs> as long as there's breath in my lungs and the doors are open. Thank God we don't have to be underground in, in an unair conditioned facility, you know, having to memorize the Bible like in China. But if that happened, would we still have the spirit to stay connected? He was connected. There was a sense of loyalty there. There was a sense of responsibility. They had a kindred of spirit. I, I kept thinking like, man, that was like, I want to have that. And I want, I want to, I, I, like, do we want that? Do we want to be connected with our leader the way that Elijah of Shaphat was? Because that's what God is looking for. We need that. If we're going to expand and grow, we need that. We don't just arrive. We need that. Tell your neighbor, we need that. We need that. Jesus says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Ask him. To give you a heart for your leader. Ask him. Pray for your leader. Because, you know, when you pray for your leader, you begin to see certain things. You begin to feel certain things. You, sometimes I don't even know what I'm praying for. Sometimes I just start going, da 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 see or not. And then I just begin to see heaven open up. Or I see, you know, the enemy coming against them. And I'm just like feeling like if I'm like Chung Lee or, you know, some kind of awesome warrior, you know, like you know, Wonder Woman or something, you know, fighting off the enemy, but it's the spirit of God in me, like, you know, get that devil, you know, get off my pester, you know, <laughs> and I feel like that when I'm praying for them, but it's like, we have to have that. How many of us pray for our pastors? There's not going to be no connection to your leader if you're not praying for them. You don't have to go out to eat or go have tacos or, you know, you don't have to do all of that. When you pray for your leader, you begin to see certain things. You begin to build a wall around them. You begin, the Lord begins to reveal stuff to you. Well, the first one is you got to be connected to God, amen. If you don't have that, then you ain't going to be able to be connected to your leader. So it's just like one, step one. Step two, but if you're on step two, then pray for your leader. Ask God to give you a heart for them. Elijah had a heart for, for his, his leader. And right here in 2 Kings chapter 2, um, everybody knew that Elisha of Tisbe was going to be taken home to heaven. And even Elijah, the son of Shaphat, he was a little nervous. It doesn't say he was scared. It doesn't say how he felt. But... He had, he felt it inside of him. And, and here, every time Elijah of Tisbe tells him, say, you don't need to go with me. You're fine. And he's like, surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you, you know. And he keeps going. Then finally, the older prophet looks at the younger one and says, what do you want? <laughs> I can't get rid of you. What do you want? What do you want from me? And he asked, and he, <laughs> and not in a way to put him down. But um, in 2 Kings chapter uh, 2, same chapter, verse 13, um, this is, oh, wait, let's go back before when he says, tell me what I can do. In verse 9, it says, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. And Elijah replied, let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. 
And in verse 10, it says, you have asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. If you see me and I am taken away, then you will get your request. But if not, you won't. But he asked. Jesus said, you have not because you asked not. He asked. Ask God. I want that anointing to heal like Pastor Benny has. Amen. I want to be able to lead people to the Lord. Whatever it is, ask. Elijah, son of Shaphat, asked Elisha from Tisbe, I want a double portion of your anointing. And sometimes we're asking for things that we don't even realize what we're asking for. I want to pay the price. I want to suffer more. <laughs> I want to be broke because I'm always giving. <laughs> I feel like when I had a job, I'm like, I just work for the ministry. I, I, like, I just give all my money to United We Can. I give all my money to all the events. I give my money to the pledges. I just work so that I could support the church of God. <laughs> and and that's, that's what it is to when, you're, when you really surrender everything. Um, I want to say this. When you're connected to your leaders, there's a kindred of spirit. There's the same spirit. And this is what Elijah, son of Shaphat, was asking for. In Acts chapter 14, verse 13, this is the time and hour when Jesus' disciples were going out. And people didn't understand what was taking place. But they said, these are uneducated men. But it looks like they've been with Jesus. And that's what's going to happen. You may not know all the Christian lingo, but when you're connected to your leader, you're going to know some things. People are going to be like, hmm, looks like you've been hanging out with the leadership. <laughs> because your, your attitude is different. The way you behave is different. I mean, these men were with Jesus, and, they, and it was evident. I'm going to read it. It says, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. But they recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Have we been with Jesus, ladies? <laughs> Have we been spending time with Jesus? Because our leaders do. Our leaders are hanging out with God. The third thing that I'm going to share on right now is the connection with the Lord. So this is different from the connection when he calls you. And this is different from the connection with your leaders. This is the process to expand. This is the connection of intimacy with God. This is another level of intimacy. Because right here, when Elijah from Shavet saw Elijah from Tisbe, the chariots of fire came between them, and he left. He saw it, so he was going to receive the anointing. But yet he still didn't know and didn't understand that level of intimacy with God yet. And when, he, and when the cloak fell, the cloak that was thrown on him back in the day, and it fell, he picked it up, and he goes back to the Jordan River, and he, and he throws it on the water, and he says, where is the God of Elisha, the Elijah from Tisbe? And the water opens. And God is going to give you and I our own experience with him. That personal experience with the creator of the universe, the commander of heaven's armies. He's going to give you that personal intimacy, the way that it says that Adam knew Eve and she conceived. <laughs> that kind of intimacy. How do you know somebody and then she's having a baby? <laughs> that level of intimacy. God is, God is going to give you that. Elijah's intimacy with the Lord came with the work that he did for God. And right here, um, I'm going to just read it in verse 13 of chapter 2 in 2 Kings. It says, Elijah picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen when he was taken up, and then Elijah turned to the bank of the Jordan River, and he struck the water with Elijah's cloak and cried out, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And the river divided, and Elijah went across. And God wants to do that in our lives. He wants to give us that experience. And some of you, he may have already given you that experience. He wants to give it to you again, ladies. This is a daily thing. This isn't just a one-time thing. This is a daily thing. Elijah, son of Shaphat, he had encounters with God one after the other. Right when he came back, nobody believed him. They were like, we're going to go look for Elijah, son of T the Tisbe. We're going to go look for him. And he's like, don't look for him. I saw him go to heaven. They didn't listen. And even when they came back, they couldn't find him. He's like, I told you. You know, and sometimes people are not even going to receive your relationship with God. They're not going to understand that you heard from God. They're not going to understand that you talked to Jesus. <laughs> it's so exciting because of the Holy Spirit. I mean, we experience in this 
21st century in this hour, a relationship with Jesus like only the prophets got to experience in the Old Testament. I mean, it's exciting. We have that anointing. We have access to the king of glory. I just, I don't, I mean, to me, I don't understand why it should be a hard challenge to talk to Jesus, to hang out with the Lord, or why someone doesn't want to pray. Oh, yeah, struggling in my prayer life again. It's like, goodness, when your relationship with God is challenged and threatened, then your relationship with people is going to be threatened. You're not going to be committed to your husband or to your spouse or to your kids or to your ministry or to your work or whatever it is. If you can't be connected to Jesus, it's the same thing. And when you have that intimacy with God, it just outpours. It outpours upon everybody. Jesus began to use Elisha, the son of Shaphat, in a way like no other. And his intimacy in the Old Testament, you see it through the miracles that he did. He came into, he did so many miracles. I mean, he raised people from the dead. He had people's, the, the enemy's eyes blinded. I mean, the water was making women barren and sick. He just said, give me some salt, threw the salt in it, and it healed. I mean, this was showing his connection to God. What is it that we're doing that's showing our connection to God? Can people show, can people recognize, does your family recognize that you've been with Jesus? Do they even come to you and be like, pray for me, please, you know? I, I want to be that person. You know, sometimes I'm like, well, did you pray for yourself first? <laughs> I'll be like, girl, you better pray for yourself, you know, and I'll pray for you, but you got to pray for yourself, <laughs> <laughs> be like, can't be just only my prayer hitting the throne, you know. <laughs> but in, um, I want to read this story, and uh, it's one of his miracles, and I just thought it was cool because it's about expanding. And this poor widow in chapter 4, she was uh, broke. Her husband died, and she had debt, and she, Elijah's like, what can I do for you? Like that level of intimacy where you're so filled with God where you're able to help other people. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. And he, and he was so, so like um, open to help her. And she's, he, she's like, well, all I have is some oil. And he said, well, go get all kinds of jars and jugs, however many you can get. And, and I mean, the oil just started pouring, expanding, expanding, expanding. And your relationship with God begins to, to outpour. It's just like running over. Like kind of like when Jesus was at the at the well with the Samaritan woman and he says, I got water that you know not of that's going to be like a bubbling brook. This kind of overflowing relationship with God. It can happen. I mean, he's pouring out his spirit like never before. I'm not saying anything that we don't know. It can happen. And God wants to give us that opportunity. He wants to rekindle that, that love that he has for you. Um, my sister, I wanted to do for the... Um, where he said, Jesus, Jesus misses you. My older sister, I'm praying for her salvation. And I had asked her, I said, what would be a good sign to like a banner to put besides, you know, Jesus loves you. And she said, Jesus misses you. And I said, whew. My heart stopped. I started to be like, you know, Jesus save her, you know. But I thought about it and I said, man, she's not saved yet, yet. But I thought, how many of his children where he says that about, that I miss you? Because we're not spending time with him. Because we're not hanging out with him. Because it's no longer a joy to, to acknowledge him for our day. It's no longer a joy because we're so caught up with civilian affairs or we're so caught up, you know, like how, how it talks about the seed fell on, on a good ground and then it fell on the rocks. And then he says that the one that had the... Um, thorns it choked it and the thorns represented life because you're so consumed with life here that it chokes the presence of God out of you you know and it's like man God misses you he misses me sometimes like now that I'm on my third kid our last kid <laughs> amen such a blessing thank you Lord but it's a challenge. It's a challenge, you know. I have physical uh, restrictions in my body and, and then this kid and that kid and the other. And I'm just like, Jesus, I miss you. I want to hang out more, you know. And, it, and, and, and it's like he misses me too. And there's a level of intimacy and connection with God that he's looking for as we expand. 
You know what happens in this place? I just want to say this. When you have this intimacy with Jesus, you have a peace that surpasses all understanding. People don't even, it's not even of this world. I want to read it in uh, John chapter 14, verse 27 and 29. He says, I am leaving with you a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace that I give is a gift that this world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I have told you. I am going away, but I will come back to you again. Jesus hasn't come back yet. If you really love me, you will be happy that I am going to the Father who is greater than I. And I have told you these things before they have happened so that when they do happen, you will believe. And this is a level of trusting God. We can't have faith in God if we don't trust God. And when we trust God, we believe what he says. And that happens in a relationship, in an intimate relationship. And, and he wants to give us that experience with with Elijah, of uh, the son of Shaphat, he had those experiences every time he prayed for something, it happened. Can you imagine? I want to get to that place. I don't know about you, but I, I mean, I just want to see things happen. And I really enjoyed Sister Destiny's uh, message because she was talking about the uh, fiery furnace. And, and that's a place it's like, and if I don't rescue you, will you still serve me? And if I don't answer your prayers... Will you still love me? If I don't heed to your requests, will you still love me? Will you still spend time with me? I feel like we're in that hour, ladies. We're in that hour. And if I don't, will you still come to church? Will you still put your hands to the plow and not look back? Even if I don't do it. I mean, God has promised us so many promises. I mean, I am asking God. Sister Hershana would tell you, like, Lord, you have promised, you have said, I mean, to our pastors, to our church. And, I mean, we are holding on to his promises. But even if he does it, we're still worshiping God. Amen. We're still standing. But that's the level of intimacy that God is looking for. The last, the last level of this process of expansion is our connection to others. Amen. We have not gotten this gift to keep to ourselves. We have gotten this gift to help others. Just like Elijah, the son of Shaphat, was helping the widow, helping the people that were out there, that the water was making them barren and sick and dying. He's asked us to, to give of ourselves 100%. You know, and I want to share this story, and it's really sad, but I'm going to just share it because even though we help others, sometimes the return isn't there. And we can't get disappointed. But if we do, it happens. Because it happened for Elisha, the son of Shaphat. This is in his later years. And he's sick. And he knows he's going to die. And he goes to the king. And he tells him, this is an arrow. And it symbolizes when you shoot it out, that what I'm going to do to your enemy. He goes, shoot it out. So the king shoots it out. And then he goes, grab the arrow. And so the king grabs the arrow. He goes, now hit the ground. And the king's like, hits it three times. And Elijah, the son of Shaphat, gets so mad. He's like, why did you hit it more than that? You would have completely destroyed your enemies. Now you're only going to have three victories. <sighs> he got so mad. And you think about it. When we work with people, you're going to get disappointed. They may not understand certain things, but that doesn't mean that you don't stop. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you so you, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, in in um, 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 15, Elijah told him, get a bow and an arrow. And the king did as he was told. Elijah told him, put your hand on the bow. And Elijah laid his hand on the king's hand. And then commanded him, open it to the east window. And he opened it. Then he said, shoot. So he shot the arrow. And Elijah exclaimed, this is the... Lord's arrow, an arrow of victory over Aram, and you will completely conquer the Aramians of effect. And then he said, now pick up the arrows and strike them against the ground. So the king picked up the arrows and struck the ground three times. And then verse 19, it says, but the man of God was angry with him. You should have struck the ground five or six times, he exclaimed. Then you would have beaten Aram until it was entirely destroyed. Now you will only be victorious three times. Sometimes we don't understand when we're working with others. But it's our responsibility to do whatever God is asking of us. 
He says to give them your kitchen table, then give them your kitchen table. Amen. I remember I came home and my husband said, oh, I told so-and-so that he could have our dining room table. I'm like, you did what? He goes, you always said you wanted a new table. <laughs> and I'm like, really? He goes, well, the Lord just put it in my heart. I was talking to him and he was saying that he had everything. The only thing that he didn't have in his house was the dining room table. And I told him, I just felt it in my heart and it just like came out of my mouth. Well, I have a dining room table. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> when your husband talks to the Lord too, better beware, ladies. <laughs> and then, so yeah, he gave him away our table. But sometimes God is going to ask things of you for other people. Do it. If he's telling you to go pray for that woman right there, pray for them. If he, I know my sister, we were in a restaurant and she felt something in her spirit. And we went to the restroom and then we walked back and then she goes, God's telling me to tell them something. And I'm like, well, tell them. She's like, all right. So I'm like, psh, I'm like an armor bear right there. And then I'm just like praying in my, in, 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 you know, speaking in tongues and quiet, you know, because I pray quiet. I'm like, Jesus, you know, whatever it is, like use her, go before her, you know, just, psh, psh, you know, start doing all of that. I feel like I'm the warrior, like, you know, paving the way. And, and then she, she tells her something. And it was crazy because the, the relationship that the child was in was in a homosexual relationship and they were going to get married. And my sister just began to share certain things with the lady. And it was just like her intimate family. I mean, this is a fancy restaurant at Maggiano's, you know. And, 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 and it was crazy. But the Lord used her. And maybe God is asking you and sharing certain things with you. You don't know what it's going to do to that person. You don't know what level of encouragement or connection with God that it's going to bring to them. You know, and it's our responsibility. If we want to expand in this process, we have to expand it with others. There's a responsibility that we have. And it has to be a wholehearted responsibility. Regardless if the other person isn't reciprocating it. I mean, regardless. This king, he only did it half-heartedly. He was like, three times. Like, you know, eh. Even after the prophet told him what the arrow represented, even after he knew what was going on, and it was a half-hearted spirit, that didn't change Elijah's spirit, and nor should it change yours when you're working with people or even with your family members or whoever it is. It's others. Pastor Benny says it's about God and people. It's about others. Other people, we're here to help others and showing them Christ's likeness inside of us, connecting them. And, and many times we can't work with people because we have unforgiveness in our hearts. You know, forgiveness is more for you than it is for the other person. God has called us to work with people. People are going to disappoint us, just like it disappointed Elijah of Shaphat. It's going to disappoint us. But that doesn't mean that we stop. Because what happens to the next person? What happens to the next person? Imagine if Pastor Benny and Sister Evelyn rolled it up and said, man, these leaders keep falling. These leaders keep backstabbing me. These leaders keep talking smack about me. And so here you come into the door and you surrender your life to God. And you're just so grateful. Imagine if they turn their back and say, I ain't got no more to give. People are counting on us. God is counting on us. And he's coming back. He's coming back, ladies. He's coming back. And this connection with others, I want to say not only about forgiveness, but one more thing. He wants to give us influence. And this influence, the reason why the king of Israel listened to Elijah, the son of Shaphat, the reason why he listened to him and, and, and struck the ground and even shot the arrow, the reason why people are going to listen to you is because the influence that God has placed upon your life. Don't take that for granted. Like David said, don't take your anointing from me. He's giving you influence. The more that you begin to live a pure and holy life, the more that you begin to be blameless, the more that you begin to, to already, you know, let what, like how my dad says, you already forgave them before they hurt you. Amen? God will give you influence. And he wants to use your life. He wants to use my life. And it will happen. We will be able, I want to read this in uh, John chapter 13. Verse 34 and 35, it says, I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. And your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. The world wants the real deal. They're looking for the real deal. Amen. Stand with me, ladies. In John chapter 15, 
Jesus says that I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me will bear much fruit. But if you don't bear fruit, he cuts you back. And it's okay. It's okay if he cuts you back because God wants to use you to reach more people. He wants to reach your level of influence greater. You think, man, why did I go through so many things? Why did I have to go through that? That's not the question. That's the wrong question. Say, you know what, God, whatever it is, I want to be used by you. Whatever it is, use my life. I don't know why you did this. I'm not worried about why you did this. Just give me the strength to persevere. Give me the strength to continue to have a pure heart when somebody wants to be able to be connected. I mean, you think about Pastor Sunny and Sister Julie. When they first started Victory Outreach, do you know how many people left? It's not just our church. It happens in the body of Christ. I mean, in Solomon, and when you read Ecclesiastes, he says nothing new is under the sun. Everything has happened. If there's anything that he could give to you is be, a, be in line with God. Be connected to God. And then you're able to expand. You're able to expand in, in helping others in everything that you do. And do it wholeheartedly. God, God is coming, church. And whatever stage you're at, it's going to happen again. The calling of God's going to come. That, that calling's going to come. That responsibility to be close to your leader is going to come again. That level of intimacy, I want to be closer to you. Jesus says, as, as you decrease, I will increase. You know that song where it goes, um, more of you and less of me. Some of you guys don't know this. I'm going to just let you in on this inside scoop. Every time I sing that part, Yvonne sings, all of you and none of me. <laughs> because that's how much I want Jesus. We have to get to that place, ladies. And not just for today. Tomorrow God's going to look for us to get to that place again. The next day until Jesus comes, he's going to look for us. But remind, remind ourselves what Jesus said. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to him. And then we're able to help others. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. He says, open your eyes. Look, ask the Lord for workers. We're his workers. We're his hands. We're his mouth. We're his feet. We're his extension in every area. I mean, right now I'm with my kids. You see them all over the place. But I want them to be in, in, in worship. When we have the prayer, when my husband shared and we had the Holy Ghost. And, and I, I want them to worship. When he started singing uh, the blessing, I mean, my dad was holding one of my sons. I think the other one was with my mom. And they were singing the blessing. I mean, may his favor. And the other one can't really talk yet. But he was like, amen. You know. <laughs> he was going to worship Jesus. Let it be known. He may not know the words, but he knows the sound. God wants to expand us. He, there's a process, though. There's a process. And we can't ever get off the potter's wheel. The moment that we say, God, stop using me, it's like we might as well be like Lot's wife and turn into a pillar of salt and turn our back on God. Let that not be you. Let that not be me. Because tomorrow's not promised to no man. And no one is exempt. We have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But God is looking for vessels that he could pour into. The oil stopped when Elijah, the son of Shaphat, was with the widow, the oil stopped when there was no more vessels to pour into. We don't want the oil to stop. In the New Testament, Jesus talks about when he comes, there's going to be ten virgins and their oil. Five of their lampstands are going to run out and the other five aren't. And I thought about it and I was like, because I have a video, The Joy Everlasting, on my YouTube. And, and the Lord showed me, he said... That the five that didn't, their oil that didn't run out, because the oil is represented as the anointing and the intimacy with God. He said, they were close to me. They weren't just getting by. Jesus wants to use us. He wants to expand in us. And, and, and I know some of you guys learned a lot about Elijah of Shaphat. But what is it going to be said about you? What is it going to be said about me? Let's bow our head and close our eyes. 
The eyes of the Lord are looking to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those who love him. And you read that scripture, it says that he found no one. Let that not be said today. Lift up your hands to heaven. Lift up your hands to heaven and tell Jesus, if you really believe it in your heart and mean it within your spirit, lift up your hands to Jesus and just tell him whatever it is that's in your heart, whether it is that you want to answer the call, whether it is that you're responding to his missing you, whatever it is that you need to forgive somebody to give you the strength to forgive them, or whether your awkwardness of being around your leadership or your stank guy because you're so critical and judgmental that you can't even see the good in them. I don't know. But Jesus wants to speak. Jesus is, is trying to get our attention. 